Hashem. All right, Jerosai, good morning, good morning. Let us begin, begin by thanking all of our sponsors for this morning's share. To thank our Talmud Torah sponsors for Adar Aleph. Mrs. Selma Wolf for dedicating all of the and Joshua's this month with immense gratitude for the refuos from Hashem and the merit of refuos from for all of those in need and in the schus of our brave soldiers and the return and merit Hashem b'sha'atov of our hostages. The Schwarzbaum family in memory of Rabbi Aaron Schwarzbaum, Aaron Yosef Ben Meir Zichron Lebracha, the Ziv Levine and Berman families in memory of Bill Ziv, Zev Shmuel Ben Yisrael Zichron Lebracha, our week of learning sponsor Steve Galaskov in honor of the bris of his grandson Nochum David Ben Elio Baruch HaLevi, and our Dafyomi sponsor for today, Alan Wiseman, in honor of the marriage of his granddaughter, Devora Miriam, to Moshe Ben Natan in Bnei Brak, happened last night. Baruch Hashem, Mazda Alan is actually joining us on the uh, on Zoom this morning. Baruch Hashem, the Chassan and Kala should just be zochah to a life filled with happiness, bracha, mazel, and simcha. And Mosai, with that, let us begin. Maybe the I don't know why YouTube is not coming up again. I don't know why, but everything else seems to be working. But uh, with, um, all right, so we'll say, so let's go. A lot to do. A lot to do. Baruch Hashem, Hazman Katsar Vahamalacha Meruba. Baruch Hashem, as always, a lot to do and not a lot of time. So we are picking up today's daf is Kofi Yates, the last daf of, let me move this out of your way, the last daf of Baba Kama. Baruch Hashem, Abba Aleinu Latova. So today's daf is Kofi Yates. We are picking up on Kofi Yates on the days 118b, and we are picking up three lines down into the wide lines. Amr of Zvid, Mishay Dorov. So remember again, we are in the midst of an overwhelmingly riveting and fascinating machlokas, which is, if you steal something and then you return it, so I just want to point out something beautiful. How incredible is it that as we get to the end of this Masechta, we're talking about people who steal stuff and return it. You see, Abba Life is a journey. When we started in these sugyas, we just spoke about people who stole stuff and didn't return anything. Now we're speaking about people, Baruch Hashem, who go ahead and steal things and return them. Musar Haskil, give people enough time and they will come through. Give people the time to redeem themselves and they come back from even the worst mistakes. So I'll say, so now remember again, we're talking about in the sugya about when you return something. First of all, it, it, Okay, where, where, where is everybody? It's the last daf of Baba Kama. So text your friend if there's somebody missing at your table or 14 people missing around your table. Right? Text them and say, what is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? How can you possibly sleep through this? It's the last daf of Baba Kama. All right, maybe they were up late learning something else. They're up late, give it time, give it time. Oh, I should take my own lesser. good. I will give it time, good. So I say, so now listen to this. Remember, again, we're talking about now in the sugya where if you steal something, you return it, what obligation do you have to inform the owner that the object is missing? So that's the middle of our sugya over here. So the Imara says, so I'm Rav Zavid Mishrei Dirava. I'm sorry, actually changes it over here, changes it over here to Begonev Mershus Bailim. Begonev Mershus Bailim. Kulei Amalo Pligi Kid Rav So I will say, if you steal an object from the domain of the owner, everyone agrees that the halacha follows Rav Chista. Namely, again, that one is obligated to go ahead and inform the Adon that the object has been stolen. V'hacha, b'shomer shagana m'eshu so, sh'yachs for the makom shagana v'kamefligi. But say, here the machlokis is, when you steal an object, you have an obligation to return it to the very same rishos that you stole it from. Rabbi Akiva Sava, Rabbi Akiva says, kal salo shmira so, that once you steal an object, ultimately again, your obligation of shmira has come to an end. Rabbi Shmuel Sava, lo kal salo shmira so. Rabbi Shmuel says, no, the din ultimately again, of his shmira has not, has not ended. So therefore again, the same way that a shomer has an obligation to restore the object to the exact rishos that he took it from, so too again, even though a shomer turns into a ganov, that, old, that, that, that shmira has not come to an end and therefore he has an obligation to go ahead and return it to the very same place that he that he took it from. Lema minyan poter tinahi. So we'll say, so remember again, let's say that this concept of counting, as well, so we've seen this idea before, we saw this in the Mishnah, right? That what happens if he steals something, return it, the owner is unaware, but he counts, he counts, let's say, the flock. 
He counts the flock. So now after counting, he recognizes that everything is present. Is that enough to go ahead and exempt the thief from liability? So we'll say, this is a great case. We'll say, watch this. Let's say Ruvain steals an object from Shimon. And what happens? Ruvain wants to do tshuva. But Ruvain is embarrassed to do tshuva. So let's say he stole money, or he stole thousands, whatever, he stole a couple hundred dollars. So now it happens to be that he's purchasing an object from Shimon. See, he decides to essentially slip in some extra money into the purchase price, and that extra money is the amount of money that he initially had stolen from Shimon. So Rose says, so what's happening in this case? So Ruvain is making it, so Ruvain is paying back the stolen money, but what? Shimon doesn't necessarily have any idea that he's stealing it back, that he, I'm sorry, that he's giving it back. So I would say that's the case of Agozlos Chavero, Ruvain stole from Shimon, and now Ruvain's purchasing an item from Shimon, and what he does is he adds more money, he slips more money into the purchase price, that additional money represents the money that he originally stole from Shimon. So I would say, so ultimately, has Ruvain fulfilled his obligation of, rest- of returning the stolen property? So Tani Chadi Yatsa, so one opinion says he's Yotze, and the other opinion says that he's not Yotze. So we assume Everyone holds of Rabbi Yitzchak. What does Rabbi Yitzchak say? The Amr Adam also in the Mashmish Bikis of Bechol Shah Veshah. And what Rabbi Yitzchak says, we saw this in yesterday's daf, that it is common for a person to kind of feel around his money purse, right, all the time. So a person knows when money's missing, when money's not missing. Obviously, Gemara says, My la So what are they arguing about? Demand the Amr Sabar, the one, the one who says. Demand the Amar Yatza, the one who says about say that when Ruvain stole from Shimon and then ultimately again was purchasing an item from Shimon and slid extra money into the purchase price. So the one who says that Ruvain is now Yose, the returning of a lost object, he holds that what? Minion Poter. He holds that simple counting. So what's gonna what's gonna end up happening? Shimon's gonna count his money, right? And what is he gonna find? He's going to find ultimately that he has what? Purchase price plus additional amounts, and therefore he will come to realize that what? That all of the money that was taken from him was returned to him. So now you have Rabbi Yitzchok who says that a person is always counting the money in their money purse, right? And that must, and therefore again, it must be that even though Reuven is returning the stolen money, unbeknownst to Shimon, Shimon will come to find out because it's common for people to, to go ahead and count their money. Uman do Amar lo yatz, the opinion that says, no, 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 when Reuven slips in more money into the purchase price, he does not fulfill his obligation of returning lost property, uh, stolen property to Shimon. Savar minyan eno poter. He'll hold that even though it's going to be common for Shimon to go ahead and count his money, simple counting of money and recognizing that now he is financially whole does not go ahead and fulfill the obligation of hashava of returning lost of, of returning lost property. Incredible. Amri, Sigmar says, no, no, no. Isir lank Rabbi Yitzchak. If you really hold like Rabbi Yitzchak, namely that a person always counts their money, call the Amalo Pligi Dominion Poter. Everyone will agree that the counting, essentially, the, when we say Minion Poter means the counting fulfills the obligation of returning the lost object. I mean, what does it mean? Since a person is always counting, that means they're going to recognize that what? That they have all of the money that they were once lacking. And therefore, the mitzvah of hashava, the mitzvah of returning lost property, has been fulfilled. Ella bit Rabbi Yitzchak kamiflegi. Rather, Rabbi Yitzchak could very well be that the kor machlokes is Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak is more of a behavioral machlokes. What's his behavioral machlokes? Do people constantly count their money or not? That that that's the shaila. Ella Rabbi Yitzchak kamiflegi. Mar isleid Rabbi Yitzchak. Umar lesleid Rabbi Yitzchak. Ultimately, again, some, one opinion holds like Rabbi Yitzchak, and one opinion doesn't hold Rabbi Yitzchak. Otherwise, if you want to say, Rabbi Yitzchak, maybe everyone holds Rabbi Yitzchak, namely, that it's normal for a person to constantly count their money. And there's not a contradiction between the prices. So we'll say this is interesting. One is talking about a case where the thief returns the money, the stolen money, into the purse of the victim, and one is talking about where he turns it into the hand. They're both saying, now here's what's fascinating about this, is if you take a look at Rashi, Rashi says, ha, it's like a little bit lower down in Rashi, ha, diktani lo yatsa, dimani gazlan, vram ele yadei dinig zal, hilchach, ikal amim radei shlichu zel teva so v'lo menan. So it says, it's very interesting. So remember, we're going back to a very specific case. Ruben stole from Shimon, at, right, at, and let's say, 
obviously Shimon doesn't know that Reuven is a thief. Afterwards, what happens? Reuven is purchasing an item from Shimon. Reuven feels bad. He wants to go ahead and do tshuva, but he doesn't want to really, he doesn't want to have to admit to Shimon that he went and he saw this. What does he do? He figures, okay, the object is going to cost $300. He adds in an extra $200 representing the money that he went ahead and stole. So the question is, does that work as hashava? Machlokes of Brysis. One Brysis says yes, one Brysis says no. The Gemara says that perhaps, perhaps what's happening over here is as follows. Perhaps the Machlokes is based on the following. Everyone agrees that we hold the Rabbi Yitzchak. Rabbi Yitzchak holds that a person always counts their money. Which means what? That at a certain point in time, Shimon, the victim, is going to realize that he's been made whole. So what's the Machlokes? The Machlokes, I will say, is... Did Reuven put the money in Shimon's purse, or did he put it in his hand? So it was when he was paying the money. So, it was, so interestingly enough, interestingly enough, so, the, so one opinion holds that he put it in his hand. Now, now here's what's fascinating. It's actually, I don't know, I thought it was counterintuitive. That when he puts it in his hand, it's coming for a person to get money, and what do they do? They just throw it in their purse. Right? They, don't, they, they don't count it. As opposed to if he put it in his purse, a person is much more cognizant of money in their purse, and therefore that could constitute a proper hashava. A very interesting. That's what Rashi says. The money gazlon verama likise. The guys, the, the nigzal, the chayvan, the islan, the bitzchak, minyan poter. Okay. So we'll say, so ultimately again, Fine, so that's the machloke. So we'll say, so now, how do we pass? And by the way, just in this case in general, because it's actually quite fascinating, I know, that, I know that we don't have time for any of this, but I will tell you like this, because this last case, I will say, is very interesting, because what we've been focusing on this entire time... Um, good. So first of all, let me just say the core halach, all right? The core halach, I will say, is when you steal something... And we, so we've been, always been focused on returning the object to the owner. What, what our suki now is focusing on is what does the owner have to be aware of or not. So interestingly enough, the Rambam writes as follows. The Rambam says, the Rambam paskins, minyan potter. Right? Minyan potter. Meaning what? That halach alamayim if you steal money from someone, and then you go ahead and you give the money back from them, and they count the money, recognizing now that they've been made financially whole, you have fulfilled your obligation of returning lost property, or stolen property, I'm sorry. You, re, you have fulfilled your obligation, even though what? Now we'll say, what's missing over here? What's missing over here? What's missing over here is confrontation, right? Not, not in a negative way, but what's missing over here is me telling Ruvain, by the way, I stole from you. So that Rabban Paskins, that does not have to occur, which makes sense, because if that would have to occur, most people would be very reticent to do tshuva. So now I know that Halach Alamaisa, I could get the money back to the victim them. And as long as the victim is going to be cognizant that the stolen money has been returned, we're good to go. We're good to go. Even if, even if again, the victim has no idea that I ever went ahead and perpetrated this. So the Gemara says, furthermore, the Ramam says, if you steal from a person in a way that they have no idea that you took it or that you returned it, you're also good to go. So for example, I sneak into Ruvain's uh, pen, you know, at night, I steal a sheep and you know what, I have terrible, I, I have terrible guilt. So I go ahead and I return it an hour later. So by the time Ruvain wakes up the next morning, he has no idea what's occurred, I'm good. I'm good. That's all the Ramam says. However, the Ramam does say, the Ramam does say, however, that in a situation where, let's say, you steal something, he says, Okay, so the Ramam goes on with a whole bunch of different ideas, which we're not going to get into right now, but you could take a look. It's Hilchos Keneva, Parak Dalat, Halach, Hasir Aleph, and Yudbeis. Now, what about the other case? What about the other case say, where you steal from someone? I steal from Ruvain. I feel terrible. And now I want to return the stolen money, but I, I, I don't want, I can't confront. I don't want to confront. So instead, I'm buying something from Ruvain, so I just want to slip in some more money. So, Agozos Chavero, Devliya Lo Becheshman, Yatsa. So, I'll say the halacha is it works. It works, right? So, halacha, I could slip him in, which I'm about to say also means something very interesting. That if I steal, so I'll tell you where this could come up. Halacha, I steal from Ruvain. I steal from Ruvain. And I'm about to say, I steal from. But I also do business with Ruvain. So there is the ability, what the Gemara is setting us up for, there is the ability to kind of make good on the theft how. But let's say, again, I, even let's say I can't slip in all of the money at once. But if over time, in various transactions, I could slip in a little here, slip in a little there, 
Halacha lemaisa, there is the ability to repay the to repay the stolen property. All right, let's go. Mishta, in lo, most a fascinating case over here. In lochin min haroin semer vechalav ugdim. So both say you cannot purchase the following from shepherds. You can't purchase from them wool, milk. Or young young sheep. Why not? I will say why. Because there is a strong concern that they are selling stuff that doesn't belong to them. Right? The shepherd is entrusted with someone else's flock. The shepherd could have his own stuff also. But there is a very strong concern that perhaps that which you are purchasing from the shepherd, he doesn't have the right to sell. Velomu shomre peros, eitzimu peros. Suddenly again, people who watch uh, fruit, fruit trees, orchards, you can't purchase from them wood, nor can you purchase from them fruit. Avalokhin min hanoshim klei tzemer b'yehuda uklei pishtan begalil va'agalim b'sharon. So we'll say again, also reflecting a, an interesting societal norm, the same issue applies to purchasing things from women. In other words, is there a concern that perhaps a woman is selling something that her husband hasn't consented to, that technically speaking that belongs to her husband? So the Gemara says, but you can purchase from women woolen, woolen items in Yehuda, or linen items in the Galil, or calves in the Sharon, different regions, different regions in Eretz Yisrael. So, say, so ultimately, because in each of these locales, in each of those locales, it was it was common for women to do commerce with these items, and therefore again it was it was permitted. Now, say, in any case, it's actually a good piece of advice in general. In general, when you're buying something from someone and they tell you, don't tell anyone, right? Generally, that's a red flag, right? That is a red flag. The kulon shom of the hot min So if somebody tells you, just don't tell anyone, or let's, you know, let's, let's do this transaction where no one can see it. So the money says, generally a good indication that you probably should not purchase it. Velochin beit simon tanagolim mikomok. And I both say, in general, you could buy eggs and chickens from anyone, because in general, eggs and chicken are considered to be cheap items. And therefore, our local lemaisa, there's, there's no concern that someone's stealing it in order to go out and sell it. There's a tremendous Moser Haskell in that statement as well. You know, sometimes the best way to live life is never do anything that you would have to hide from someone else. Right? If there's something I'm doing, if there's something I'm doing, and I only do it because no one is looking, or if there's something I'm doing, and if someone else were to find out, were to find out I wouldn't want to do it, don't do it. Don't do it. Anything you have to be matmin, anything you have to, anything you'd have to hide, much better to avoid committing in life. Incredible use. So turn out on. Ain lo chemin aron velo easy velo gidiim velo gizim velo tolution shall semer. So we'll say in general, the brisa now expounds these or expands. These are the things that you can't go ahead and purchase from a shepherd. You can't purchase goats and not sheep and not. Gizin are like uh, shearings, fleeces, velo tlushin shal semer, or pieces of wool that have been removed. Avalochim mehen tfurin, mipnei shein shalahen. But you can't purchase from them tfurin, because ultimately, again, tfurim Rashi says, begadim tfurim, sewn garments. Sewn garments, mipnei shein shalahen, because we assume that those actually belong to the shepherd. Velochim mehem chalav, ugvina bamidbar, velo biyishuv. Furthermore, you can purchase from the shepherds milk and cheese in the desert, but not in habitation. I will say, interestingly enough, Rashi points out over there, that's because generally the owner of the flock is mafkir, any type of milk or cheese that comes from his animals in the desert, because they're in the desert. He's not going to get them back. So he's mafkir them. That's why the shepherd could have them. You can also purchase from a shepherd four or five sheep, or four and five fleeces, but not two sheep and not two fleeces. Okay, well, Rabbi Huda Omer, you can purchase ultimately from the shepherd domesticated animals, but you cannot purchase from the shepherd any type of uh, desert animals. So let's analyze this. The general rule is, we'll say here's a general rule. When you're buying something from a shepherd, Anything that you would buy from a shepherd and the balabayas, the owner of the flock, would recognize was missing, you could buy that from a shepherd. Why? Because then we could assume it's not stolen. Because we'll say, how do shepherds steal? How do shepherds steal? In very nuanced, undetectable ways. But shepherds are not going to steal in a way that the owner would know about. Therefore, you can't purchase something from 
the shepherd that could go undetected by the owner. But anything that you can purchase that would not go undetected, you can buy because we assume that that belongs to the actual shepherd himself. So we'll say, so we said before that you could purchase from the shepherd four or five sheep and four or five fleeces. I don't understand. We'll say, if you could buy four sheep, then what? You certainly could buy five sheep. As I also remember again, the higher the number, the more significant the sale, the more significant the sale, the harder it would be to shield that or to hide that from the owner of the, from the actual owner, which, which, which testifies, which, which essentially indicates that this is a legitimate transaction. So if you can buy four, you can certainly buy five. So Amar Chista, Arba Mito Chamisha, Amar is like this. If the shepherd is watching a flock of five sheep you can, and he wants to sell you four, you could do that. Right, you can do that. Why I both say because that's a pretty good indication that he's not stealing. Because if he would steal, if that that type of theft would be clearly detectable. Others explain. Others say Chista says that's what that it means. You could buy four sheep from him from a small flock, small herd, and five sheep from a larger herd. Okay. So the Gemara says, "Hagu fakashi." I don't understand. It's inherently contradictory. Amrit dalid vehei zon dalid vehei gizin. You said four or five sheep or four or five fleeces. Dalid vehei in avashlosh avashalosh lo. So we'll say four or five means what? Four or five means what? Four or five, but not, but not. Three, right? So the Gemara says, so that's one inference. Ema seifa, but yet look at the seifa, avalo state zone, but yet the seifa said you can't buy two sheep. What can you infer from that? Ha shalosh zabninon, but three you can. So we'll say, so which one is it? So the Gemara says, lo kasha ha bebraisa ha bekechishta. So we'll say, if they're healthy sheep, you could buy even three. So we'll say, if, if they're weak sheep, you would need to buy four to five. Again, we'll say the, the principle is a very simple one. The concern of purchasing from a shepherd is that is he going ahead and buying stuff, or selling stuff that's not his. But the only way a shepherd steals from the owner is when the theft would be undetectable. So as long as the purchase is significant, significant as defined, that it's significant enough that if the, that if the shepherd was selling something that did not belong to him, the owner would absolutely recognize and know this, then you could buy from the shepherd because we assume that he's not stealing. And obviously that is going to be subjective depending on what it is that you're buying. Incredible. Let's go ahead. Rabbi Omer buys us low in the hand, Rabbi Yudah says you could purchase, you could purchase, um, you can purchase domestic animals, not, not we'll call it like range animals, desert animals. So Mar says, Is Rabbi Huda commenting on the first part of the Mishnah, the Reisha, and therefore again is being Machmir? Or is he commenting on the Seifa and being Mekel? So we'll say, perhaps he's commenting on the Reisha and is being Machmir. When the Mishnah, right when the Reisha said that you could purchase from the shepherd four or five sheep, so Rabbi Huda comes along and says, that's true domestic animals because then the owner will know but if you're purchasing range animals right the herd that's out in the desert you can't even purchase four or five why because since it's in the desert maybe the owner will never know or maybe Rabbi Hud is coming on the seifa and maybe he's going lakula. what's the kula right the seifa said right you can't purchase two sheep or two fleeces from the owner. Hani mili midbarios. That's true, range animals. Ava baisos shtaim nami lokhin. But I will say, when it comes to domestic animals, you can even purchase two, because again, since it's domestic, then what? The owner is going to know if they are missing. So Tashma, let's analyze this. So I will say, so we're just trying to figure out what is Rabbi Huda commenting on. So Tashma, the sign of Rabbi Huda Omer, lokhin baisos mehen, fein lokhin mehen midbarios. Rabbi Huda says, you could purchase domestic animals, you can't purchase range animals from shepherds. But I will say, whether it's domestic or range, in all cases, you can purchase four or five sheep. And I will say, now what's the logic of that? What's the logic? The logic is four or five, that's a lot of sheep. That's a lot of sheep. So that the, the, if, if, the, if the shepherd was stealing, you would not be able to pull off that level of theft undetected. So I will say, top of Kofiotes. Last daf of Baba Kabo. Rabbi since the since it says in any situation, Shema Mina Seifa Kai Ulakula. Therefore, Rabbi Huda is really commenting on the Seifa, and ultimately, again, he is being Makel. So therefore, Rabbi say what Rabbi Huda is coming to introduce is Rabbi Huda is saying this whole thing with numbers, this whole thing with numbers. How many numbers? All of this ultimately, again. 
all of this is dealing with with halacha lemaisa range animals, range animals. But when it comes ultimately again to domestic animals, Rabbi Huda would say to domestic animals, the owner is much more aware, and therefore again, even a smaller number of sale would be permitted because the owner would be able to detect the theft. Incredible. So I'll say second line from the top, one nineteen a. So I'll say the Mishnah said you cannot purchase from. You cannot purchase from people who go ahead and guard fruit. You can't purchase fruit from them, right? Fruit watchmen, orchard watchmen. You can't purchase fruit, nor can you purchase wood from them. Again, once again, the concern, they're stealing. So, so the Gemara says, Rav Zavin Shabishta Me'arisa. So Rav went ahead and, 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 and purchased Shabishta from a sharecropper. So both say, what's Shabishta? She says, Chavile Zmuros. Ultimately, again, a bundle of vines. So you purchased it from a sharecropper. So I'm going to buy a hotna v'lo mishor peros, eight simo peros. I buy. He says, so Rav, how can you do that? How can you do that? The Mishnah says you're not allowed to purchase wood or fruit from a fruit watchman, right? From someone who watches. So how can you purchase from the sharecropper? Ha'arale. So this is no, no, no. Hani mili b'shomer the less they begufa the aramidi. The Mishnah is talking about a shomer. But we'll say, what is a shomer? Shomer is a is is a is a paid a paid watchman. So we'll say, what does a paid watchman get? He gets a salary. What doesn't he get? He has no share in the orchard, right? He has no share in the fruit, no share in the wood. Aval oris de isle bigave. But I will say, but a sharecropper, sharecropper has a share in the fruit and in the wood. I assume that when I purchase from the sharecropper, ultimately, again, I'm purchasing from his share itself. So I will say a very interesting distinction. So Rav is coming along and saying this din of being concerned that you can't purchase wood or fruit from the shomer is a din in the shomer because he gets a wage, nothing else, but a sharecropper who is entitled to other things, fruit and wood, you can purchase from him. Incredible. Tana banon. Shomer peros lochen mehen kishen yoshvin umochrin ba. So also listen to this. The bride says as follows: Even people who are shomer peros, right? So even a shomer who watches the vineyard uh, or orchard, whatever it is that he's watching, you you can purchase produce from them as long as what? As long as they're sitting and selling, and the baskets of merchandise are in front of them. Vitortani, Rashi says over here, tortani are scales. There are scales in front of them. So both say, why? What's the logic over here? In other words, if you set up like a business, right? You have like a stall in Machana Yehuda, and you're going ahead, and you're sitting, and the baskets are there, and, and the scales are there, fine. Th- then, you're, then we assume that you are a legitimate businessman. The Kulin Sha'amru Hatmein Asr. As I was like, but anytime you go to a merchant, and he says, you know what? Meet me out back, right? Meet me out back. Let's, uh, right? So anyone who tells you that you have to hide the transaction, generally, again, know that they're dealing in stolen goods. Similarly, again, I will say when you're purchasing from, similar from a garden, if they sell to you the goods at the entrance, we have the garden, you're good to go. If they tell you to meet me at the back of the garden, don't do it. Itmar, gazlan, me'emas, mocho, likno, I will say, this is a fascinating question. Let's say someone is known as a gazlan. My son is known as a gazlon. So I'll say, so now the question is, at what point in time are you permitted to do business with a gazlon? As we'll say, so the shayla is like this. And this question can be understood in a variety of different levels. Stam, I know that someone is a gazlon. But I'll say, but just because someone is a thief doesn't mean that what? Doesn't mean that what? That everything they own is ill-gotten, right? It could be they're a thief sometimes, you know, on the weekends, you know, or whatever, you know, just, uh, but, but not all the time. So the shayla is, I will say, or someone was a gazlon, but they're doing tshuva. But I will say, but tshuva is a gradual process. So now I want to do business with, I'd like to purchase something from this person, but how do I know that it's Stolen or not. So we'll say this is fascinating. Say my Gazlon, may must mark the Liknos. Gazlon, from what point in time are you permitted to go in and purchase one? Raf Amr Achete Rov Mishalo. Raf says you have to know, you have to know that the majority of his property or his merchandise is not stolen. So therefore, we'll say all you need is not all you need, but you need rove. That way, when I transact business with him, I could assume that what that I'm purchasing from the rove, and the rove is not stolen. Shmuel or Shmuel says no, no, no. mio chalo. Shmuel says no, no, no. Even if the even if the minority of his property is not stolen, I have the ability to rely on the fact that as long as rove is not uh, sorry, as long as miot minority is not stolen, when I transact business with him, I am purchasing from the miot. It's actually pretty wild. Or really, Rav Yehuda la Ada Daylo kedivrei Omer Afilu Miut Shalo. So we'll say this is incredible. So Yehuda, Yehuda said to Ada. Ada was a person. Daylo means he was a. Rashi says Shamish Drabanon. 
he used to help out the rabbis. So, so, so Yehuda pointed out to Daila that as long as the thief has a minority of his property that ultimately is his, then halacha lamay say you could do business with the rabbis. Say, by the way, if you think about it, it has to be that way. Why does it have to be that way? Because it was at the end of the day, you really have no idea if someone's honest or someone's not honest. But it's, otherwise, how does how does a capitalist society? Work, right? I, I, I don't know what you are. You don't. You don't know what I am. We each have a cheskas kashros. But Lamaisa against Rabbi Huda said we operate with the premise that as, even if someone is a thief, as long as the miut of their property is properly gained merchandise, then you're good to go. And I will say you could assume, you could always make the assumption that even with a thief, at least the miut of their property is properly gained. Incredible. So the Gemara goes weiter. Mamon Maser. So we'll say what is fascinating. Incredible cases. What do you do with the money of a Maser? We'll say. So remember again, we just had this case. Remember the guy, Rev Kahana snapped the guy's neck a little while ago? It was a few thousand years ago, but for us, but for us it was a little while ago. I would say, so remember again, that's a moser. A moser is someone who hands over juice to a despotic government. So I would say, so what can you do with the money, with the property of a moser? So Ravuna Rabbi Huda, Chad Amra Mutra La Abdo Biad. So one so say, Ravuna Rabbi Huda, so one of them said that you are allowed to destroy the property of a moser. Chad Amra Asli Abdo Biad. Others said, no, no, you're not allowed to destroy his property. So Manda Amra Mutra La Abdo Biad, so the opinion is that you could destroy his property, actively destroy his property, lo mamonu chamar migufo. Both say, if you're allowed to kill a moser, as we saw by Rav Kahana, you're allowed to kill a moser. So, of course, you can kill a moser, then what? You can certainly destroy his property. Oman dama asr abdo, the opinion that says you can't destroy his property, why not? Both is incredible. Dilma havele zara ma'alyo, because maybe the moser will have upstanding children upstanding children, and therefore, again, his children will get to benefit from his property. By the way, Zara doesn't have to mean children. Zara could just mean offspring. In other words, preserve the wealth. Don't destroy the wealth, because maybe somewhere down the family chain, there is going to be someone righteous, and that righteous person will be able to enjoy the wealth. After all, the positive says, Sometimes something is prepared for the Rasha, but the Tzaddik gets to wear it, which is another way of saying that sometimes Kodesh Baruch Hu gives the Rasha wealth not for the Russia. Not for the Russia, but for the tzaddik who is going to conquer. I will say a tremendous Musar Haskil. What's the Musar Haskil? I will say we often think that family is a determinant of who you become. Right? If you're born into a righteous family, you're going to be righteous. If you're born into a wicked family, you're going to be wicked, right? And there's, there's certainly a lot of psychology tied up in the fact that our identity, who we are, what we are, how we see the world, is so much intertwined with our parents. And that is absolutely unequivocally true. But lest you think that who you come from is a determinant, of, a complete determinant of who you can become, that is unequivocally false. You choose who you become. I, I came from a dysfunctional family. I, I have dysfunctional parents. I have this, we'll say, there are plenty of children who come from parents who are tzaddikim and choose to become rishayim. And there are plenty of people who come from fa- parents who are rishayim and choose to become tzaddikim. Who does, it doesn't mean that it's not a struggle. And it doesn't mean that it's not difficult to overcome baggage that you get from your family. Absolutely it is. But Lamaisa, you make the choice about who you want to become. And we'll say, that, get so many, so many different examples of this, but here it is in the Gemara. Here it is in the Gemara. We don't destroy the property of the Moser. Why? Because he may have righteous offspring. Righteous offspring, I will say, you know, Moser, Moser is like the bottom of the rung, right? Better to commit all other averus than to be a Moser. The, the, Moser is the, low, the lowest of the low. And yet, even from a Moser, you could have righteous offspring. And I would say we don't choose where we come from, but we absolutely choose where we go. Incredible, incredible. Okay, not enough time. So the Gemara goes weiter. Listen to this. Rav Chista had a sharecropper. So it's interesting. So the sharecropper was very precise in measuring everything out. Right? A little bit for you, a little bit for me. Now, the problem was he was a bit too precise in that he was taking more for himself than he was entitled to. So the Gemara says, what happened? Salke. Rav Chista fired him. And he went ahead and he said the puzzle about himself. Well, so, okay, so he quoted about himself this particular pasuk from Mishlei. 
Okay, so I'll say, so now listen to this. So ultimately, the Gemara says like this. Uh, so, I'm sorry. So the end of the Pasuk, I'll say, is as follows. It's actually quoting two psukim. Two psukim. So the first part of the Pasuk that is really quoting that applied to himself is that, is that sometimes, sometimes the tzaddik receives that that, was, that originally was hidden by the wicked. So he was referring to the sharecropper over here who was taking stuff for himself. Once he fired the sharecropper, now he had more wealth. But now I'll say, focusing on the second part of the Pasuk. The second part of the Pasuk was Ki yasha ala that when you steal from someone, their stole, their soul, sorry, you steal from someone, their soul, we'll see who the there is, but their soul is taken away from them. So the Gemara says, whose soul are we talking about? One says it's referring to the soul of the victim, and one says that it's referring to the soul of the, of the thief. The one who says the soul of the victim, Pasik says, this is the derech, this is the manner, right? This is the way of every person who steals. He takes the soul of the victim. So we both say, so we refer to theft as the stealing of the soul of the victim. Pasik says, don't steal from the poor person because he is poor. Because the Pasuk says, if you do so, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will punish, will punish the thief by removing his soul. See, the soul refers to the thief. Ah, what does the first opinion do with the fact that it says, Nefesh Baylavikach? My Baylav, what does it mean, Baylav? Baylav Dahashta means the current owner, i.e. the thief. Nefesh. Why is it ultimately again that their soul is lost? Because they hurt the victim. Okay, so each each one is able to both say. So the shaila is who does who does theft have the greatest impact on? Does theft have the greatest impact on the victim, or does it have the greatest impact on on the thief himself? I will say, which is such a tremendous idea. Who would have ever thought to look at it this way? We always assume we always assume if Ruben steals from Shimon, so I will say, right? The thief steals from the victim. The victim is the victim, right? The victim is the nigzal, to which the one essentially saying is, maybe not, you know, the, fee, the victim lost money. The victim lost money. I would say, but when you commit an avera, especially a, a, an avera bin adam lechavera, an interpersonal avera, the thief himself loses so much more than his money, right? The thief loses his soul. The thief loses his holiness. The thief loses his spiritual side. And both say, what a tremendous way. So I, we think that the, the person who lost the money is the true victim, whereas it could very well be that the perpetrator of the crime is the true victim of his own own crime, the true victim of his own ill-gotten gains. Incredible. But I'll say dramatic line in the Gemara. Amram Yochanad Kala Gozlas Chavero Shave Pruta Kilunot El Nishmasa Mimenu But I'll say when you steal from your friend, even a Pruta even a Pruta, it's as if you've taken his soul from him. Now I'll say, now this is a very dramatic statement. The Gemara says, Shin Emar, Kin Arachos Kobot Seabat says, Nafsha Bala Vikach So I'll say, so actually before we get to this well actually let, let's, let's do it. So I'll say as the positive says, Kin Arachos Kobot Seabat says, Nafsha Bala Vikach. When you steal from Something you take their soul. So what Pasuk says, Va'omer, Va'achal Ketsir Chavalach Mecha, Banecha Ubno Secha. Says someone else will consume. You're harvesting, your reapings, and ultimately again, and will inversely impact your children. Va'omer. Furthermore, the Pasuk says, Mechamas Bnei Yehuda Sher Shafchu Damnaki Ba'artsam. From the Chamas of Bnei Yehuda, both say Chamas is different than Gezel. Gezel is stealing something without paying. Chamas is forcibly taking something and then throwing the money at the merchant. So you're paying for it, but you're taking it without the owner's consent. Va'omer. Val Shaul Val Beis Adamim Al Asher Hemis Is Hagivonim. And the Pasuk sees that Shoel. Sorry, Shaul, King Shaul, that he killed out the Givonim. All right, so what's happening over here? My Vomer, Vichitim, and Nefesh, they are all Nefesh, Banavo, Benos of Lo. So I'll say, you might have thought that when you steal from someone, you're only adversely impacting the victim himself, but not the victim's family. Tashma, Basra, Banav, Ubenosov. No, I'll say, when you steal from someone, you're potentially adversely impacting not just the victim, but also the victim's family. Vichitim, Ahani, Mili, Hecha, Delo, Yav, Dummy. You might have thought, but only when, when is theft bad? Only if you don't pay. Aval, Hecha, the you have dummy, but if you pay, in other words, we'll say, like Hamas, I forcibly take the object and I forcibly pay. In other words, the person, the owner of the object, doesn't want to sell. I'm saying, you know what, I don't want to let what you want get in the way of what I want, right? So therefore, I take the object and I throw the money. You might have thought, ah, that's not a big deal. 
אבל איך עוד יודעים מלא תשמע? מחמאס בני יהודה ששפכו דם נקי בארצם. פוסט אפרס על הווייטס ליין. סי סי פרמי דה פוסט קולס חמאס, which means a forcible transaction, a cause of bloodshed as well. וכי תהנה הנה מלא איך עוד יכבה בידיים, you might have thought maybe only theft is bad when you actively steal, אבל גרמה לו, במי רבו סי, kind of like causative theft. Right? Indirect theft. Maybe it's not such a big deal. So, Tashma, El Sha'ol ve'el beis ha'domim ala sherheimis es ha'givonim. So, we'll say, the Pasuk talks about gives liability to Sha'ol that he killed the givonim. Remember, it says, V'chi heicham ha'zidim she'sha'ol ha'gis ha'givonim. When did Sha'ol kill the givonim? Sha'ol never killed the givonim. Elo mitok she'har ha'gnov ir ha'kohanim she'em ha'speakin. Lahen ma'inu ma'zon ma'ala alav ha'kasav kilo ha'ragan. Rather, Rabbi says, Shaul didn't kill the Givonim. But who did Shaul kill? Shaul wiped out Nov, the city of Kohanim. This Nov city of Kohanim were responsible for supporting, really providing employment for the Givonim. Well, once Nov was gone, the Givonim had nothing to eat. And therefore, again, the Navi treats it as if Shaul stole from the Givonim. Say it from Rabbi says, just look what comes out of here. So the Gemara says, if you steal from your friend, even a Shavar Pruta, it's as if you've taken his soul. And we extend that to mean what? Not only his soul, but you adversely impact his children. Not only actual theft, but even Hamas is problematic, and not only that, even causative theft is going to be problematic as well. Now, I both say that statement of Rabbi Yochanan, that when you steal from someone, a Shavar Puta, it's as if you've taken their soul. So, I both say that is a very dramatic statement, and seems to be, if you think about it, just like a bit hyperbolic. Now, maybe not, maybe you're a person who has no money, and therefore, I both say, you take a person's last Puta, that's it, they have nothing. I both say, but maybe it means something a little bit different as well. I both say, when you steal from someone, call a gozlas chavero. So I both say, when you steal someone from someone, what is the message that you are imparting to the victim? If you're the thief, what's the message you're imparting to the victim? You're worthless. You're worthless, right? Because if you are worth something, if I if I if I respected you, and and I and I looked at you like as an equal, as a peer, then I wouldn't do this to you. So I will say, when you are gozo es chaveru, when you steal from someone, essentially, you make them feel like a shava pruta. You make them feel almost absolutely meaningless and worthless. So I will say, to steal, in other words, people don't steal from people they respect. They only, right, theft is the greatest display of disrespect. I don't care about you. You're worthless. Your ownership means nothing to me. As far as I'm concerned, you're a Shavah Pruta, right? So I will say, so thief, thief makes a person feel like they're a nothing, like they're a nothing in the eyes of the person who stole from them. I was saying, the worst thing you could do to someone in life is make them feel like a nothing. The worst thing you could do to someone is ultimately to make them feel like they are valueless. So I will say, you know, we've all been in situations in life where we've been demeaned, where we've been degraded, and when we've been made to feel like an absolute zero and nothing. And I was saying, those are the most painful moments in life. And that pain is so acute. Kilu notel nishmaso mimenu. That it's as if, mamish, you're taking the very life from a person. I would say, sometimes the worst crime we commit against another person is making them feel like a nothing. And when you do that, when you make a person feel like a Shavar Pruta, Kilu Notel Nishmaso Mimenu. I would say how careful we have to be to build each other up. How careful we have to be to be mechazek one another. How careful we have to be in the way we treat someone else. You disrespect another person, Gzela is one manifestation of interpersonal disrespect. You disrespect someone, that feeling of, of that feeling of knowing that I'm a nothing in the eyes of someone else, that feeling of knowing that I'm a zero in the eyes of someone else, ultimately can be tantamount to Mamish robbing that person of his very life. Incredible Gemara. All right, let's go weiter. Let's go weiter. Says the Gemara. About lokim mina noshim. We always say that you could purchase. Remember again, you could purchase from the women. We had this list of items that you could purchase. So turn up on a lokim mina noshim. Klei tzarim yehuda klei yeshem galil. So also you could go ahead and purchase woolen items in Yehuda, linen items in the galil. About lo yenos shmanu usalasos. We always say, but you can't purchase from women. Wine, oil, and fine flour. Again, the concern over here is, are they selling it without the consent of their husband? Not from servants and not from children. Because we'll say, again, the whole concern in all of this is, are they selling stuff that doesn't belong to them? So we'll say, interestingly enough, a woman could engage in small transactions in order to buy herself a 
to buy herself a shaitel, right? No, to buy herself a head covering. Since the assumption is that a husband wants his wife to cover her hair, and therefore, again, he has no problem if she's engaging in commerce in order to pay for a head covering. Okay, the kulin sha'amru the hatmin asr. But I will say once again, anytime you're engaging in a transaction with someone, and what they tell you, shh, you know, like don't, don't tell anyone about it, not good. So, gabay tztaka, lokrim edarmot. So, what's actually interesting is that tztaka collector allowed to collect tztaka from women. Uh, both say this isn't a serious issue. This is a this is a monetary issue. In other words, we have to be concerned that maybe the woman is going to give away money that doesn't belong to her. So you can take a little bit. In other words, if she gives a little bit of stucca, that's fine. But you can't take a large gift. In other words, because we're concerned. I will say obviously this is all reflecting a different societal norm. But it's a concern ultimately again that is she giving away money that does not belong to her. It was interesting. The olive pressers could purchase large quantities of, of, of oil. I'm sorry, large quantities of, of, of olives, right? Why? Because we'll say, since it's a large quantity, a woman is not going to sell that unless, of course, she has the consent of her husband. Smaller quantities, we're a bit concerned, we're a bit concerned, lest they go ahead and sell without the consent of their husband. Shimon Amil Omer, Lochim Imeshim Zaysim Bemuat, sorry, Bemoid, Begala Elyon. Shepamim Adam Bo sorry, it's right. It's really right. Be bemo right, bemoy. Uh, he changes it over here. Changes it over here. Bemuat. So you know, in we'll say in the Galil, you could even purchase small amounts of all of 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 olives from women. Why? Listen to this. Shepamim Adam Bosh Limkor Apesach Beso, Venosim Ishtamacheris. We'll say sometimes a person needs to make a little extra money, and he's embarrassed. The man is embarrassed ultimately again to go ahead and sell small quantities of olives in order to make some extra money. So what does he do? He empowers his wife to do so. Which we'll say such a tremendous Moshe Haskell. When it comes to doing Doing what is needed for the family, men are often still concerned about their ego. Women will do anything and everything they have to do to take care of the family. It's, it's incredible. So like a man, he needs to make money. I don't want to sell the olives. I don't want to sell the olives by the front of the house. What's the chavra going to say? Right? What are they going to say to me during Haftorah when I'm in the kitchen, you know, making gear? Right? What, 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 like, what, what are the guys going to say? What are the guys going to say, right? Women don't care about these things. Women don't care about these things. For women, women are mission-driven, and at the end of the day, if the family has to be supported, then we'll do what we have to do to ensure that the family is taken care of. It's incredible. So the Gemara goes right there. Ravina went to Bemechuza. Asu Nashi, Ashin, Asu Nashi de Bemechuza, Rami Kame, Kavli Vishiri. So I'll say, Ravina went to Mechuza, and the women were selling to him or giving to him bracelets. Rashi says over Kavli Vikuzle. Rashi also, Rashi goes on both sides on this staff. Rashi says over here, where is it? Um, Okay, I can't find it right now. Whatever it is. They were giving before him. They were giving before... Uh, sorry, it's on the left side. Kavli v'kuzi, shashara zav v'shirit smidin. So they were giving to him gold chains and bracelets. So it was and I, he accepted it from them. Amrali rabbit al the ravina v'atanya gabay tztaka m'kabla mehen davramu. So apparently, again, ravina was there collecting tztaka. They were giving him gold chains and bracelets. Aye, so they asked, but how are you allowed to do that? After all, again, ravina, we learned that the gabay tztaka could only collect small amounts. So the gemars, avalo davramu Amrlay Hani Libne Muchuza Davramuatina. So Bose said, so Ravina said, you know, people of Bene Muchuza are wealthy. They're wealthy. So for them, gold chains. And bracelets, this is considered to be like, uh, you know, a good script. You know, this is, this, is not a, this is not a big deal for them, and therefore I could collect this from them for tzedakah purposes. And Kerala will say, Mishnah, Muchen, Shak, Muchen, Shakobis, Motsi, Hare, Elu, Shalom. So we'll say, now some very interesting cases. Now we're talking about, we'll say, last Mishnah of Masechah's Baba Kama. Last Mishnah of Masechah's Baba Kama. So we'll say, so now we're transitioning to a new topic. What's the topic? When you give over something to a craftsman, a lot of times, after the craftsman does his thing, there's some leftover materials. So now the shayla is, what is a craftsman allowed to keep versus what does he have to return? So, Muchin, Moshavosai, Kovis. Kovis is a launderer. You give a launderer, you give a launderer a woolen garment to launder, so often there's like some tufts of wool that come off in the laundering process. So, Muchin, Shakovis, Shakovis, Motsi, Hari, Elu, Shalom. So ultimately, again, the launderer gets to keep the tufts of wool that come off the launderer. 
object. Vasorik, someone who combs wool. Motzi, Sigmar says, Vasorik, Motzi Hare Elu Shabalabais. When a person combs wool, the wool that comes off with combing, that's given back to the owner of the wool. Koves Notal Gimelchudin, Vehein Shalom. A launderer could go ahead and keep, you know, say, if there often there are, when you launder stuff, there's like additional strands of wool that come off the garment. He's allowed to keep up to three strands. Yes, sir, Mikan, more than that, that becomes a balabais. However, we'll say, if there are black threads on a white garment, he could keep all of the black threads. So we'll say, similarly, again, if a tailor, right, left over. Leftover um, chut. Chut is a, is a strand, right? Uh, no, better than a strand. Uh Thread, thread, right? A chut could they lit for in order to be used for additional sewing? That ultimate, or, or matlis shehu gimel gimel, or let's say again the tailor does his thing, and there's a piece of fabric that is three finger breaths by three finger breaths. Hare elu, hare elu shabalabayis. This becomes the property of the balabayis. Masha harash motzi. So I will say that which a carpenter, so right, so you have a carpenter who's working with wood. So that which the carpenter will say, so now once he's working with wood, there are shavings, right? There are additional pieces. So whatever the carpenter is, is and the carpenter is working, I will say, with a matzad. A matzad is an A's, right? So he's working, I think that's how you pronounce it, A-D-Z-E. So it's, it, I, I, I Googled it. It's what, what, what it is, is it's essentially a small axe. It's like a very small ha- handheld axe with a, a narrower a narrower blade okay so ultimately again so I'll say so if the carpenter is working with the aids then ultimately again those shavings those shavings belong to him but if he's working I'll say shield is an axe Right, that's the that's the you know zaftig axe. That's the real axe. So I will say so those produce more significant more significant wood chips. So that belongs to the balabayis. But I will say if the carpenter was walking in was working in the home of the balabayis, then I will say interestingly enough in that case everything. Even I will say again the sarim is sawdust. Even the sawdust belongs to the balabayis. All right, let's go. Tarabanan lochin mochin minakobes mipnei shein shalom. So I will say therefore. Again, remember the first thing we said in the Mishnah is that when a person launders a woolen garment, any of the any of the tufts of wool that come off of that belong to the launderer. Therefore, you are allowed to purchase tufts of wool from a launderer, right? Because again, because the mice again they belong to him. So again, the launderer could take the two upper threads from the garment. Those like the he- threads that hang off the garment, and those belong to. We'll say Amid Day's last Amid of Maseches Babakama with four. Four minutes to spare. We got this. Again, where it says, "Velo yatel bo yosem yishlo shachuvin." I will say, uh, interestingly enough, you should not use more than three threads. Three, all right. You, sorry, "Velo yatel bo yosem yishlo shachuvin." Then ultimately, again, you should not go ahead and utilize more than three stitches per loop. We'll discuss what that means in just a little bit. Similarly again, when combing wool, you should only comb wool vertically and not horizontally. That, that diminishes on the amount of, that diminishes on the amount of wool that's scraped. Remember again, when you comb, by definition, some wool is, is coming off. So apparently again, better to do it vertically and not horizontally. So the Gemara says, When evening out the garment, you even out the garment on its length, but not on its width. The imbala hashvoso, but Allah Chalamaisa, again, if you want to go ahead and even it out, right? The Gemara says, at tefach rashay. Up until tefach, you're permitted to do so. Fine. So the says, Omer Mar, Shnechut. And so the said, two, two threads, Vahanan Tanan Shalosh. But I, we went ahead and we said that he could keep up the three threads. Lokashia, Habalimi, Habikatini. One is talking about, Rabosai, a thicker garment, and one is talking about, again, a, a smaller garment. So Rabosai, so obviously, I just want to point out, this goes without saying, a lot of these halachas, in other words, about what you could keep, what you can't keep, how you, this is subjective and also societal, right? There was also very often like a minagam makam about what you are allowed to do or not allowed to do. So the Gemara goes weiter. Furthermore, when combing the garment, you should only comb the garment vertically, but not horizontally. I vatanya ipcha. I say, but we learned just the opposite. Lokashia habiglima habesarbala. One is the talk about two different garments. Well, so Rashi says over here, there's glima. Rashi says it's that's an everyday garment. 
versus a sarbala, which was a more elegant garment. Good. We'll say, furthermore, again, you shouldn't do more than three stitches per loop. By Rabbi Yirmiya, I'm tuye va'asuye. So we'll say, it's very interesting. So I'm sorry. So by Rabbi Yirmiya, I'm tuye va'asuye chad. So we'll say, when we say a loop, what, what constitutes a loop? Ultimately, again, is it, is it passing the needle through and, right, and going ahead and bringing it back? Is that considered one? Oh, Dilma, I'm tuye va'asuye tre. Or maybe looping it through and bringing it back is considered to be two stitches, to which the Gemara says, teku. All right. Umashil akavalol rachbo. You could even out the garment in, by, through its length, but not through its width. So we'll say, so remember again, all of this talking about what a, what a merchant is permitted to do or not permitted to do. So you could, you could go ahead and straighten it out, even it out in the length, but not the width. But we learned just the opposite. Lokashia habiglima habehemni. One is talking about a garment versus one is talking about a belt. All right, so we'll you know what we'll do? We're going to stop over here for today. So we'll say we are going to Mirz Hashem finish the rest of the Amud. It actually goes pretty quickly. The rest of the Amud in Mirz I think. I, I, in Mirz Hashem by the Siyum tonight. So I will say, so first of all, so we'll, we'll hold off the Mazda of Baba Kama. So for those who are unable to attend the Siyum, so we'll, put the, we'll post the link on the, on the WhatsApp chat. In Mirz Hashem, it'll be live streamed on YouTube and on Zoom. Zoom, Emirat Hashem, so however you want to watch it. So, we will be to finish the Bosses. Remember again, the schedule for tonight is Emirat Hashem, 5.15 to 5.45 is welcome or derves, 5.45, 5.45 Mincha Mayriv. So, which means even if you're running a little bit late, don't worry, we're not going to start the shear before 6.15 tonight. That's going to be the earliest we start the shear. And then Emirat Hashem will go from there into the Sudan, into the Siyum. We will say it's going to be a dramatic and beautiful and overwhelming evening. What an accomplishment. Again, we're not finished yet, but we're almost there. We can see the the finish line. You can see the Hadron Allah just out of sight. And I will say, Emir Sashem, so tomorrow, and tomorrow we begin Bab Mitzia. I will say, new Masechta, new beginnings. Maybe Baba Kama was your best Masechta, maybe it wasn't your best Masechta. Maybe you were on time for Shir, you weren't on time for Shir. Maybe you came for Shir, you didn't come for Shir. I will say, the beautiful part is every new Masechta comes with Daf Amnesty. Whatever you did beforehand makes absolutely no difference. Tomorrow is a brand new beginning. Tomorrow you write for yourself a new narrative. Tomorrow we begin a new journey together and we are Zohar and we are to do it together. I will say, Bishat Tov, for tonight, Shkayach, everyone. All right, Chevron Zoom, have a great day, everyone. Amen.